All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from an extremely sunny San Diego heat wave right now, actually. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Vanessa Thompson, who is just up the coast in the Bay Area in San Francisco. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Yeah, and you've worked in sustainability and finance for the past 10 years. You've worked yeah. at the UN Foundation, the Nature Conserv Conservancy, the World Bank, JLL Spark Ventures, and numerous Silicon Valley startups. You, uh, Your podcast has hosted Olympian Venus Williams, Eric Schurenberg, former CEO of Inc. and Forbes, and many other people. And uh, you graduated summa cum laude from UC Berkeley. And um, and your innovative book, which is going to be released next year, yes. which is Redefining How Sustainable Leadership Can Accelerate Business Innovation. And which we yes. wanted to focus today was on innovation and, and disrupt mm -hmm. disruptive innovation. And, and talk about disrupting traditional thinking by taking a systems approach to breakthrough innovation. Yeah. And and it's interesting you, do, you say a systems approach, Vanessa. So I'm interested in that because a lot of people would think, oh, well, you know, innovation is like, you know, all this blue sky thinking and throwing things against the wall and kind of, you know, it's a kind of an artistic endeavor, if you like. Yeah. Um, so So tell me what you mean by a systems approach. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll also kind of kind of lead in with kind of yeah. what is, you know, disruptive innovation, what is breakthrough innovation and kind of why is it, you know, so successful amongst, you know, clean tech and sustainability companies to be much more innovative than traditional thinking? And what is it about the sustainability innovation framework that helps us think in a more innovative way? And I became really interested in this, you know, witnessing countless startups and ventures really seeing why is it that all of these sustainable companies are able to go to market quicker, that are better at retaining talent and faster at developing IP. That really was something that intrigued me and what kind of led into the, to this book and everything like that. Um, and so, you know, out of building this book and the 60 case studies of this book, what we realized is that there's kind of seven key principles that normally allows sustainability to actually be a great framework for innovation in a company. So you can actually utilize the framework of sustainable thinking to innovate. And so that really leads us to a systems approach. And I'll give I'll give you a good example of this. So there's a great company called Interface. Um, and I think they're one of the best you know, case studies in the book, mainly because they transformed from not being an innovative company or not being a sustainable company and transformed to being one of the most innovative and sustainable companies in the United States. And they did this after being a mid cap stock that was mm. public um, in the right. 1990s and they, they completely switched. So I think they're a great case step. Uh, you know, great case study, considering that I think a lot of companies are wanting to make that transition. And they're a commercial carpeting manufacturer. I mean, they're a very traditional business. Mm -hmm. So we considered as one of the leading innovative companies in the United States, that's pretty shocking. And so what they did is in around the 1990s, they did not have a sustainable business, right? They were using oil in almost everything. Their carpeting was made out of plastic, which is from, you know, oil derived and all of these things. And the CEO finally said, you know, we're going to become not only, you know, carbon negative, we're going to become incredibly innovative um, and we're going to become sustainable. And what that did is it put a lot of constraints on the overall operating process. So they had to use less water, less mm -hmm. energy, less waste, all of these things, but actually still have a very high quality end product. And so it forced mm -hmm. an efficiency. So right. suddenly all of these processes that were traditionally really old school. So one of them, for example, is dyeing this carpeting, dyeing all of the yarn and everything like that. That hadn't been changed in 5,000 years. So the process had been roughly the same. Um, and they decided that they weren't going to boil and put all of this color in the dyeing process. They were going to spray it on. And it ended up actually reducing costs by yeah. $50 million. Um, so what's interesting is that when we utilize sustainability, not just as something that we have to do, but we actually think about it as how can this framework spark innovation? We end up having a lot of breakthroughs in this regard. So the book has a lot of case studies on that, but I think that's that's one that kind of answers your question in terms of how yeah. does the sustainability innovation framework actually help us with innovation and systems thinking? It actually mm -hmm. pushes us towards it. And I think this is something that you know, not a lot of people are thinking about in terms of 
we can actually use sustainability as a frame of thinking to push better system thinking, you know, and, and within sales as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's fascinating what you what you just said there, especially, you know, the case study that you just outlined, um, because I mean, I guess when you're trying to transition to when you look at all the elements of what you're doing and you try to transition to sustainability, I mean, sometimes, especially because it's a very evolving field, right? I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. there aren't there aren't or the alternatives aren't developed enough or, or you know, yeah. proven enough. So so how do you do that when you're trying to be more sustainable, but you also have to be realistic about what you can do and what really yeah. isn't there yet. What's more aspirational than it is like uh, yeah. actually implementable. Absolutely. And I think that when a lot of companies run into problems, when they're actually not thinking about sustainability authentically, and that's normally where they run into problems. We're just going to follow what everyone else is doing. We're going to implement the same technologies, which are normally, mm -hmm. you know, very expensive if you're just following what your competitors are doing. But if you're actually thinking about how can I innovate, how can I break free of this and actually think about it authentically throughout your operations, it normally ends up, you know, raising revenues and actually reducing costs. So, we, you know, we see time and time again, the statistics that show us that, you know, 85% of global customers have shifted their behavior towards sustainability, that sustainable products grow on average three times faster than products that don't have a sustainability pledge. So we've seen all of these statistics, but it, it brings up your question, how do we actually do this? What's actually practical? Mm -hmm. And I think specifically in a sales context, one of the things that's the most practical is actually listening to your customer. Because when we think about listening to our customer, that's how we build those long-term relationships. It's how we build that trust, which all normally ends up leading to more sales in the future. But it also ends up kind of coming back to what do they need and what are their needs? Because that's ultimately what's going to lead to successful sales. It's going to lead to successful business. But then it also ends up prioritizing what sustainability features are actually going to be practical mm -hmm. and relevant to. So I'll use one more case study uh, yeah, example. Please. and. Uh, Barry Calibo is an interesting, completely different industry. They're actually a chocolate producer. They're one of the world's largest chocolate producers. They mm -hmm. produce one in every five bites of chocolate and they supply to, you know, some of the more well-known brands like Hershey's and M&M's and stuff like that. You may not know they're the actual supplier right, right, right. to them. And you know, they're also a company that initially wasn't sustainable. We all know that chocolate is a very, you know, unsustainable industry, things like that. And they mainly supply to chefs, they supply to restaurants. So they're selling, that's, that's their audience. They're mm -hmm. supplying, you know, the distributors, they're selling to the chefs. And so having a close relationship to them, and this is really, I think, important for the kind of the sales element of this, is really how they develop their next big innovation that ended up helping them lead the entire industry, which is they found that these chefs didn't want, want just chocolate. They wanted new innovative ingredients. They wanted something no one's ever tried before, mm -hmm. right? these new products, these new ingredients from all around the world, you know, what's new, what's innovative, that's what they really wanted. And then they decided to collaborate with their farmers. Mm. Their farmers understand the plant better than anyone else. They spend their whole day with it, right? right. They found out that the cacao is not just the seeds that make the chocolate, there's a fruit around it. And that fruit is actually delicious. And mm. they had been throwing that out for years, about 70% of the cacao product was wow. being thrown away. They were just wasting it. And the local people had sometimes made it into a liqueur. You could you know, make it into dried fruit, all of these other products. And so connecting that collaboration between the customer and their supplier, what they found out was that they could make thousands of new products from something they were originally just wasting. And so this is interesting. And it's actually yeah. a concept that I call in my book, Waste to Value, where you're looking at all of your waste and seeing, can I make it into a new product? But the, the element here is that you actually collaborate with your supplier and your customer. I think this yeah. is important for, for salespeople to, to see in terms of the innovation that happens within sales. Um, and mm -hmm. they actually ended up coming up with incredible products from pharmaceuticals to cosmetics to all right. these different food products. And they ended up actually being able to grow into all of these other markets that they weren't otherwise accessing and ended up mm -hmm. becoming also a leader within, within the chocolate market too. But they also became more stable as a company because they could kind of put not all of their eggs in one basket, but create all of these other products as well too. And they were already investing in producing this. So right. I think that's one great example of how yeah. collaborating with your customer is helpful. Yeah, that's a great that's a great example. I mean, it's a fantastic example, but it's a great example, as you said, about listening to your customer, but also mm -hmm. from your customer learning about their customer. 
right? Yeah. So we, as you know, mm -hmm. consumer behavior changing, you know, the mm -hmm. you know, people now like, as you said, like, like new things, they like to source, they like to see where right. it's sourced from. Is it, is it fairly sourced? Is it all of that kind yeah. of stuff? Uh, and, and then, as you said, then going back, instead of, instead of coming up with the solution themselves, it's going back to the suppliers and collaborating mm -hmm. and, and then finding that you have this awesome solution. I mean, I think that's a fantastic, that's a yeah. fantastic um, case study. What other examples have you like that? Because I think this is very, very important for our audience to understand if you like that whole flow of information, like and that whole collaboration across the value chain. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think that, you know, when we're thinking about innovation within sales, which I think is not a common conversation, we normally mm -hmm. think about the product teams or R&D teams yeah. being the most innovative, but there's so much innovation that can happen within sales. And we see that collaborating with the customer can even be helpful in terms of the customer using the product innovatively. Mm -hmm. So when you collaborate with the customer, you find new ways. Now, very successful companies have used this method. For example, the Instagram stories as a feature to the Instagram app were actually developed because Instagram was collaborating with the customer and they realized that customers wanted to share more instantaneous daily feeds with their community. And because of that, they actually created a whole new feature, which ended up kind of setting Instagram apart. So whenever you're collaborating with the customer, you're actually able to find new innovative ways to use your own product at yep. times too. And, you know, even Uber Eats, for example, was developed because they found out that customers were using it to go to their favorite restaurants mm -hmm. and hence how Uber Eats was developed. So whenever you're collaborating with your customer, I think that's a really great example of how you can innovate as well, because your customer might be the source of innovation right there. Yeah, and and that's always a really important thing because, as you said, because salespeople are kind of the 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 uh, the conduit for that information. They're the ones who are who are who are obviously talking to the customer. And the great thing about you, know, you can sit in product development and you can develop a product and you can you know do all your analysis and you can do once you put it into the market and into the hands of customers they always end up using it in ways that you could never have imagined or that you yeah. never thought about. And you wouldn't, but you wouldn't get that information back if it wasn't for the salesperson being the conduit. So it's often a piece yeah. that's really, really missed is, mm -hmm. is that feedback loop. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, listening to the customer ends up being really helpful. When we even use the example of interface in, in the past here, interface was actually did their whole transition from being an unsustainable, you know, kind of traditional, not very innovative company to becoming one of the most innovative companies because the CEO was listening to the customers. Mm -hmm. So it was originally because in the 1990s, Ray Anderson, who was the CEO at the time, sat down with a bunch of press and a bunch of customers. And one customer from California raised their hand and said, what's your environmental policy? And he actually had an awful answer, which cost the, the business quite a lot. And he said, mm -hmm. Well, we're not breaking any laws, was his response <laughs> to what is your environmental policy. Of course, the company was like, oh, we have to prep the CEO more. You know, they saw that as a press issue. Mm -hmm. But then it really made him think, OK, I actually need to listen to what the customer wants. And the customer is asking for this now. So in order for us to be innovative, we need to be listening to the customer to see that that's the type of innovation they want. And mm -hmm. I think that's really when it ends up becoming so beneficial to the organization is when it's coming from the customers, right? It's not just mm -hmm. an internal push or, you know, just some kind of investment you're doing or some greenwashing you're doing that ends up just costing the business a lot, right? It has to come from the customers. That's how you end up kind of prioritizing mm -hmm. the right strategic moves in any regard. Yeah, and 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 uh, absolutely, and that means then you can focus in on the places where you can, where number one, you can create the best value, but number two, you mm -hmm. can actually implement something real, right? Because yeah. I mean, a lot of times you hear people like saying, "Oh, we have this big sustainability initiative or this big green initiative," mm -hmm. and it all just comes off as it, it's nice, but it all comes off as it's 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 a white paper. You haven't actually done any mm -hmm. of these things. Yeah. Um, it's as as I said, aspirational. But to, but to your point, if you're listening to your customers and you're going to the point of value where you can actually make an impact um, doing it doing it like that targeted is is better than as I said going going big picture and uh, really just yeah. uh, pontificating without any result 
Yeah, absolutely. And to add to that, I think that kind of brings in the topic of authenticity too, mm -hmm. as well. And I think this is important, whether we're talking about, you know, the sustainability innovation framework or not, but within sales, it's so important to bring in that authenticity because that's really what builds that long-term relationship that drives, you know, longer term sales as well too. And I see this with a lot of global brands. When we think of, you know, the most successful commercial brands out there, they're actually representing values. They're not just representing a product. When you think of, you know, Disney or McDonald's or even Tiffany's, when you think about them, you know, most of their ads are not even about the product. They're not about, you know, this is going to be, you know, the best jewelry for you at the lowest price or, you know, they're not doing that. They're, they're actually showing their values. This is about romance. This is about, you know, family. This is about all of the values that that brand represents. So all you have to show is their logo and suddenly, you see a series of values. And I think what's great about that is you actually start as a customer to identify with the brand. And mm -hmm. that's really great because that's when you start to see advocacy amongst the customer where they're actually referring it to other people is when you actually connect with the identity of the customer. And so that's when you're thinking about the brand in terms of values that resonate with the customer. Suddenly your customer becomes an advocate for your brand as well. And sustainability is a part of this, right? We see a lot of companies actually taking even sometimes political stands nowadays more so than ever before. And the reason for that is because they're actually trying to connect with the values of the customer because now the customer sees themselves in the brand and they're more likely to share that onward. So we see this a lot with sustainability, but we see it with a lot of other types of things when we, when we think about values associated with the mm -hmm. brand as well too. Yeah, and, and as you said, I mean, I think as long as it's authentic and that, uh, and it's not, you know, um, I think sometimes, unfortunately, brands go overboard and, uh, you know, start yes. to, you know, start to become more activist and, you know, and and it's mm -hmm. kind of, and you're, you know, you may be turning off half your, you know, your. Um, yeah, it's a risk. Your, your consumers. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too, though, I think is if you, if you flip it on its head, sometimes just by doing, you know, cause sometimes people will say, yeah, it's great to do sustainability, you know, but it's going to, you know, it's going to cost us this much. We're going to have to do all of this stuff. But if you actually take a step back and you just do things that are sensible for your business, you may, you sometimes find yourself heading in that direction anyway. Like for instance, I mean, we'll, we, we have, over the last number of years, like we we went to a virtual organization long before before COVID, right? Because we felt that that was the right thing for people. It was mm -hmm. the right thing for talent. And we didn't honestly see the value of having huge offices everywhere, right? We just thought right. that making people commute and all of that, we just didn't see that. You know, mm -hmm. our infrastructure is like on AWS. So, you know, we're leveraging the best, most sustainable, like, in so over time, we became a very, very green organization just by making smart business decisions. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, what I'm seeing with all of these case studies in this book is that this either increases revenue mm -hmm. or reduces cost. And you shouldn't be investing in anything that doesn't do sure. either of these things. So I think that's something that you really have to think about too. This is not just for those values that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. This has to be something that has an ROI. And if you can't yeah. prove the ROI from the beginning, you shouldn't be investing in it. So, you know, this is something I see even, you know, when we were talking about Barry Calibo and the chocolate, you know, factory as well too. I think this is a great strategy, right? You know, just here is just waste to value. What are you wasting in your organization? Mm -hmm. That's not efficient, right? Yep. Just look through all of your waste streams. What are you investing in that you're throwing away? And in the case of Barry Calibo, it was 70% of their produce mm -hmm. they were just throwing away. So mm -hmm. sometimes just going through and saying, what am I wasting? What can I use more? And mm -hmm. try to get in that kind of philosophy um, actually can be something that not only reduces costs, because suddenly it's not a waste product, it's actually an input. Um, but it also drives revenue and it enables you to have more products as well, too. So I think all of these seven principles that we showcase with all of these 60 case studies in the book are all something that have massive you know, influence on margins. So um, yeah. that's one great strategy is just the waste to value strategy. Look at all your waste. See how you could be using it more effectively. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, um over the last number of years, uh, you know, they, especially in, I mean, if you take it in, in technology and all of SaaS and all that kind of stuff is that many, many industries, you know, have celebrated this idea of just top line revenue growth at all costs and forget about, you know, forget about the cost side of it. No, it's all about, right. it's all about top line growth. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, 
and that in that actually discourages exactly what you're talking about it discourages yeah. looking at ways to discourages all of that um thankfully you know, because of your know, market changes and everything people are now going oh, oh, path to profitability so they're being forced if you like to look at the waste side of the equation and the cost side yeah. of the equations so i think that's a really positive thing because personally mm -hmm. I just don't believe in a business that doesn't like if you can't right. operate profitably. I mean, I don't understand like how you can call yourself a business. I know like there's yeah. lots and lots of businesses that uh, are multi billion dollar businesses that actually uh, yeah. you still don't generate profits. But uh, but I so I think the time is is right now because at least yeah. people can, are starting to look at the cost and waste side. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you know, kind of even the bigger problem within that is short termism too, mm -hmm. right? about short-term growth and you're yeah. not thinking about the long-term you know survival of the business and you really can't innovate when you're thinking that way because innovation necessitates at least around a year turnaround time for most right. you know massive when we're talking about really valuable breakthroughs when we're talking about the Barry Calibos or you know the interfaces of the world that have really become the most innovative companies you do have to have at least a year I'm not talking about a long term but I'm talking more than a quarter um, and so this is something that's really important. You know, you know, we see the CEO of BlackRock talking about this all the time, which is short termism, you know, really killing companies in a lot of ways. And even when we talk about, you know, Peter Drucker, who, you know, once told us that we must kind of innovate or die, all of those, you know, great thinkers always told us that we have to be able to invest if we want to be innovative and innovative you know, solutions are something that are a necessity for the business's survival. So I think that it's always important that if you do want to be an innovative business and you do want to innovate, whether it's in sales or marketing or product, you do have to be looking at around about a year timeline. And there's ways to justify that, too. But that's really the kind of timeline you need to be thinking about to, to implement, you know, good innovation that's actually going to be valuable to the company and not just a Band-Aid. So that's that's kind of what I've seen in the research. Yeah, fantastic. So tell us, um, what is it? Do you have a title for the book, and do you know when it'll be released? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be released in 2025, and it's about accelerating innovation, and that's the the title of the book, uh, accelerating innovation. And it's based on these 60 case studies. Um, and I'll, you know, I, I think that it really came about when you know I've grown up in Silicon Valley, which is a very unique culture. We're all about you know experimentation and a new way of doing things. And, you know, working, you know, in venture capital groups to uh, working in larger organizations, I just saw countless ventures and was really wondering why is it that these, you know, sustainable organizations were able to innovate so much faster. So that really made me, you know, want to, to delve into this research. About two years ago, a book publisher reached out to me and asked me to write a book on innovation. And so that enabled me to, to write these 60 case studies. Now, I developed all these 60 case studies from actually interviewing executives at 60 su successful sustainability companies. Um, so it's very actionable. And that's something that I like about it as well, too, because this is not, you know, a theoretical business right. book by any means. This is just a series of case studies that are actually successful businesses that have done turnarounds in many cases towards a more innovative solution. Um, and I think that's what businesses really need when you're thinking about a business book is you really need just case study after case study in, in vastly different industries, mm -hmm. showcasing seven principles of how can you innovate more. Yeah. Um, and so that's really what the book is is all about. Um, and a lot of you know the companies are Silicon Valley startups, but you know they're all around the world. Um, and so I think that gives kind of a good amount of you know diversity for any company to be able to look at this book and say, okay, how can I innovate more? It might be that I take, you know, one of these principles out and I have these five examples, or maybe I take several of these principles out. Um, but I think it's something that all companies really need to be thinking about because what we're seeing is that markets are becoming more competitive day by day. Um, and the only way to stay in the game is to innovate continuously. So, you know, 1950s, we saw Fortune 500 companies staying on that list for 65 years. And nowadays it's about 14 years. So, you know, you really have to. 65 to days. <laughs> No, exactly. It's two quarters. Um, <laughs> you really have to be able to continually innovate. Um, mm -hmm. So this is something that's a, a real necessity wherever you are in the organization. Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of why we developed the book um, the way that it is now. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, this has been great, Vanessa, and hopefully you'll come back yeah. next year when the book is uh, published. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I run the Sustainability Experts podcast. You can find that on our website, which is the-sustainability-experts.com. And we've had, as you've mentioned, great guests that come on, like Olympian Venus Williams, who, in addition to being an Olympian, runs three environmental businesses. It's one of the reasons why she came on. And a lot of other executives. And in each one, we take on a different topic within innovative business and how your business can innovate. So, you know, sometimes we're in, you know, looking in it athletic leisure or things like that. And how do you innovate within that industry? And the next one, it's going to be journalism. So we take on very different industries and how you can innovate within that. Um, and then we also have a consulting practice and speaking practice that are attached to that as well. So you can find us on the sustainability experts on LinkedIn or our website, or you can contact me if you want, which is Vanessa Thompson. Um, I'll be on LinkedIn as well. Um, but love would love to collaborate with, you know, anyone who's, who's open to. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Vanessa. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.